Uh, cricket is a game that's played by many, many personalities. But there are a few silent gentlemen on the field of play who, as this man who's joining me today, likes to refer as the third team on the field. And they are very much the third team because if they aren't around, the match isn't going to happen, nor are you going to get a fair game. And that team are the umpires. And of course, I'm joined by five-time umpire of the year, Simon Toffel, someone who has, you know, who has been really appreciated by the fans for a record that he set, a record of excellence. And that is something we all aim to emulate in our different fields of work. So Simon, thank you so much for joining me. First and foremost, how are you spending time away from the game that we all love so much? Well, Nishad, uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's great to be with you. And, and yes, we do pride ourselves on being the third team and we need three teams to have a good game of cricket. And just like the, the other two teams who play for victory, we play for no one to notice what's going on and for no one to actually draw attention to ourselves. So we do try and do that. But your question about COVID-19, Look, it's throwing up some tremendous challenges for us right now, both personally and professionally. You know, I'm not immune to the direct and indirect effects. You know, my work has definitely curtailed. It's, it's plateaued and if, if anything, it's actually dropped quite a lot. So I'm not working as much. I'm getting very good at being a chef. I'm getting very good at being a gardener. <laughs> my lawyer skills have really improved of late. I think I've got the uh, the neatest looking house in the neighbourhood. Um, and what's fascinating for me, Mishad, is almost my role with my wife has reversed. She goes out to work three days a week part time. I get to stay home and do the cooking and the cleaning and the washing. Um, so after my many years on the road of international travel and you know jet setting around the world to a fish cricket, here we are. Um, she's the breadwinner now. Um, keeping us afloat and uh, paying the bills. And I'm stuck at home doing the breakfast and the lunches for the kids and, and looking after the place. But we are quite lucky here in Australia where our infection rate is quite low. But social distance is something where we need to remain very vigilant about. We don't have a cure. We don't have a vaccine. So I really encourage people to apply a lot of our high performance lessons around patience, resilience, and making sure that we, you know, don't get complacent, absolutely. Exactly, and uh, it's quite interesting you mentioned patience, resilience, and we often use those words when we are describing a test batsman or a test bowler, you know, who a bowler who will run in day in and day out, try to bowl those long spells, or a batsman surviving, trying to get his team through to the end of day's play. How can you define patience and resilience in context of being an umpire? You know, what are the factors? Well, well, patience doesn't mean doing nothing in the context of being an umpire or, you know, someone who wants to advance themselves. Patience in our area means working hard, looking for ways to improve and being ready for when the opportunity comes along. So patience doesn't mean just twiddling your thumbs or just waiting for things to happen. It means working hard and, and being prepared for when that opportunity does present itself. So patience is a really important term that sometimes gets misunderstood. Um, and resilience is all about uh, probably two things. Number one would be, how can you keep building yourself up, your self-confidence and your self-esteem through, you know, maybe jotting down lists of what's worked in your career, what people have said about you in a good way, um, achievements that you've made, uh, and keeping that list of, you know, good moments, good achievements, and telling yourself and being kind to yourself about positive self-talk that you know you are a good person you're worthwhile you do contribute people do value you and the second thing is about what is your tool what is your what is your strategy around when you get that setback or when something doesn't happen that you want to have happen what do you turn to and that's why it's good to have that preparation list with you because sometimes you need to be reminded how good you are and, and put things into context. But then you need to, you know, I've talked to people about what I call the ARIA method, which is sort of um, accept that, you know, bad stuff's gonna happen, life is not perfect, and that you do make mistakes and you don't get always get what you want. So acceptance is, is a really important factor. And in today's youth, there's a real low level of acceptance. You know, we Particularly want- Particularly with social media. 
yeah, we want good quality, we want it now, and we don't want to pay for it. And when something doesn't happen to our standard, we don't accept it, we get upset. Um, so acceptance is a really important concept. Um, then release, let it go. I think far too often we hold on to bad stuff and it's like an anchor, it, it just holds us back. And, you know, I've got a, a, a 21 year old son who gets very upset and very uptight when things don't go according to plan. And one of his big challenges is just letting go. You know, don't sweat the small stuff. Um, pick your battles, <laughs> is what I keep telling him. Um, and I stand for imprint. You know, so see yourself actually achieving and doing what you want to do and see yourself visualizing good things happen. And, you know, you look at your religion, you look at your history around spiritual beliefs. I, I believe in karma. I believe that good things happen to good people. And if you do good things, ultimately, good things happen to you. When you try to shortcut the system or take what doesn't belong to you, I think ultimately that comes back to you and a negative event will happen. So I believe in karma. And, you know, acknowledge. Acknowledge that you're not perfect and that things aren't always going to happen the way that you want. And I think, as I was saying before, perspective and context is really important. So for me in umpiring, I always kept a record of my number of appeals in a day and across a test match. And when I sat in the change room doing my self-assessment, if I got one wrong out of 20-odd appeals for the day, that's pretty good. If I get one wrong out of six appeals, that's probably not good. And across the test match, you know, on average, we might have 40 to 60 appeals across the five days. If you've got one or two wrong across those 40 to 60 appeals, in context, that's still a pretty good day, you know, a pretty good game. And, and I think that, that helps you keep perspective. And, you know, in the world of sport, we're saying things are never as good as they seem and they're never as bad as they seem. And where did that come from? Because you started umpiring at such a young age, you know, when you were 26, 27, making your international debut. Did you have that maturity back then? You know, you talk about processes, about finding the right things, about focusing on the good. But at that young age, you know, you can easily be distracted by something that's gone wrong. So was that maturity always there? No, Nishad, we've got to go back. We've got to go back to when we started. We've got to go back to this thing called, called the apprenticeship. You know, look, I started umpiring cricket, outdoor cricket at the age of 19, but I, I actually started umpiring indoor cricket a couple of years before that as a part-time job with, with Barry Knight, of all people. Oh. And that's probably where I sort of cut my teeth around getting a part-time job, managing a, a sporting contest in an indoor cricket environment, um, dealing with people who disagreed with decisions. Um, I learned my run-out skills pretty quickly sitting up there in the chair, but it's, it's not a great place to actually see a lot of run-outs from. Um, and, and then when you start umpiring, you don't start at the international level, you start at the lowest level of the game, just like a player. Yeah. And you learn your skill. And it's not just about the skills that you learn, but you learn about yourself. You learn about your own self-awareness about what works, what doesn't doesn't work, who you are, um, how to get the best out of other people, how to respond to certain events. And it is an apprenticeship. And I do believe that it does take 10 years to get to world class, no matter what you take up. And it's a, it's a, it's a school of hard knocks. And, and, and being in New South Wales, I was extremely lucky, very, very lucky to have really good umpires around me, a really good umpiring fraternity, the New South Wales Cricket Umpires and Scorers Association, I genuinely believe that they are the best resource umpires and scorers association in the world. And people who are willing to give and share their experience so freely and so willing to try and mentor, train, coach, and try and put those experiences into young minds. And that's where you've got to use these quite a lot. And you've got to have this attitude of humility that you don't know it all and you've got so much to learn. And one of the great things about the game of cricket, like life, is it always throws up something new. It always seems to find your level. So that's why we need to keep continually working to improve who we are. So in other words, you've got to be a good person first. And then second of all, put those vocational skills on top, you know, the umpiring skills. And so when I look at good umpires, they've got to be extremely good at preparing. They've 
have got to be incredibly um, strong in effective communication. They've got to be a team player. They've got to be able to resolve They've got to be able to lead by example, but also lead from behind and serve the game. You know, when you started out this session by talking about the third team, we serve cricket, but we love cricket and we want to participate. We want to enjoy the game just like the other two teams, which is why player behaviour is so important to us because nothing will turn an umpire off faster and see them leave the game than abuse from the players or players who just don't want to behave themselves. So we, we want to enjoy it as well. And we love cricket and we want to play our role. And the best way that we can do that is through servant-based leadership and doing what the game expects. You just said, you know, you love the game as well. And that is quite obvious. But, you know, having the best seat in the house, so to say, how difficult is it to keep your focus when, say, a great batsman or a great bowler is putting in a performance of his life? I mean, we in the media, a lot of the times are told to remain neutral and we do. But when, irrespective of the team, when there is someone who's doing something really exceptional, you do mm. tend to get a little bit carried away. Does that happen to umpires as well? Well, I can only talk for myself because I think we're all different and we approach pressure and stress and outside influences slightly differently. And for me, it really helped to sort of disengage from the scoreboard to not really get too involved in who was batting or who was bowling and not get emotionally involved in that. For me, it helped to almost, you know, disassociate for, for, for the players and the personal issues that were going on and just looked at the batsman's pads or just looked at the ball or looked at the play and not worry too much about who was coming in. You know, occasionally you can't help yourself because you're human. And I talk about, you know, one of my IPL sort of highlights was standing out in the middle of Wanketi Stadium and seeing Sachin Tendulkar coming out to bat with Ricky Ponting. And you think about those two guys coming out to open the batting for Mumbai and you almost have to pinch yourself and you say, well, how good is this? How lucky am I? Mm. But it counts for nothing because at the end of the day, as I talked about with servant leadership, the players just want the right decisions. The fans, the media, they just expect you to do your job and when you start to become emotionally engaged with what's going on then you're not actually doing you're not in that zone of, of you know what you've got to look for and what you've got to do and, and I don't ever want to second guess myself about oh should I give that person out because they're such and such or should I be aware of what the crowd wants or what the you know what what uh, what number he might be on in terms of batting or how many wickets this bowl has taken. So I really try to, that's my style. Other umpires are probably different and they can handle it slightly differently. And that's okay. But that's what that self-awareness that I talked about before is really important to know how to get the best out of you. And that seemed to work very well for me. And going back to your first ever game in international cricket, it was uh, when Adam Gilchrist got a hundred and you've played cricket in fact with Adam Gilchrist. Talk us through that experience where you're umpiring while your own former teammate is just blazing blazing his way to a century. Well, look, there's not too much that I remember about that game on January 13, 1999. You remember the and date? <laughs> I remember the date because I've got a bat in my room that was signed by both of the teams. It's got the date on it. And, of course, the date sticks with me. But I don't remember too much about the game. And I'll give you a very classic example. I was sitting in India one day at an IPL event. And of course, there's lots of cricket played on TV uh, across various TV channels. And I'm sitting in my hotel room one day waiting for the hours to pass for the game to start. And this game of cricket comes on and I thought, that looks familiar. And it turned out to be that match wow. at the SCG, Australia-Sri Lanka. And I didn't realise who the captain of Australia was. It, 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 I'd forgot. And who do you think was captaining Australia that day in 1999? That day, uh, it would be, was it Shane Warne? It was Shane Warne. Yeah. But who would have picked that? Yeah. Now, I totally forgot. That's how much, and I didn't even remember that, that Adam Gilchrist scored a century that day. You know, the two things stand out for me that day, that, you know, I think about my game. I don't think about what the players are doing so much. 
I remember walking out on the ground and looking at the big screen replay with my partner, Terry Prue. Terry Prue, name on the screen, 35. That was his 35th match. Simon Taufel, one. Yeah. I remember that. The second thing I remember is actually making my first decision, which was Brendan Julian bowling to Santa Jaya Surya. And I gave him our court behind, nice big thick edge, very noisy SCG, very glad to get that one out of the way and get it right. They're about the only two things that I remember from that game. I don't even remember who won. I don't know what the scores were. And I didn't remember Gilly scoring 100 or who the captain of Australia was on that day. It's, it's really great because later when you made your... Now, neutral umpiring as such became a real, a real full force around 2002, 2003. But you made your test debut in a game that uh, was featuring Australia and the West Indies. Yeah. What was it? Was it very challenging being uh, being uh, an umpire for your home side, and you know how much have times changed as the as we moved to neutral umpiring? Was that more challenging? I've got to correct you there. I don't have a home side. Huh. I don't have a home team. All okay, umpires are uh, origin. <laughs> Let me correct myself. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've got the same passport, but uh, you know, neutrality is a fascinating topic. We have a different neutrality policy for test matches compared to one day international, compared to T20s. So neutrality is different for all three formats of the game. That's interesting. And it's always this balancing act between having the best umpires available while also providing for opportunities for people to show us what they can do. Um, because most of our learning and experience comes on the job. You know. Cricket's one of those fascinating sports that we don't practice or train like we play. And there is nothing that beats experience. And so in those shorter formats of the game, our neutrality policy is different to try and give access and opportunity for match officials to show us what they can do under pressure in the heat of battle. Um, but back to your question about Boxing Day 2000. Uh, look, it was... Probably more nerve-wracking and, you know, more internal pressure umpiring at home in Australia because you've got your family and friends right there. And even though I live in Sydney and that game is in Melbourne, a lot of, a lot of people who I know in Sydney came down to Melbourne to watch. You yeah. know, I remember Dick French, our president at the Umpires Association, was there. Um, a lot of close friends. I took my wife and my my baby son at the time. And in a lot of ways, that's great, but there's more distractions. And, and if you want to just focus and concentrate on your role and your task, I'll tell you, it's far, far easier to officiate away from home, away from your country. And all you've got to do is eat, sleep, and think cricket umpiring. When you've got friends and family around, they want free tickets, I want to have dinner with you. <laughs> I want to talk about the match, you know, and that becomes a huge distraction and it's not what you're there to do. So for me, uh, I definitely do find it easier officiating away from home. But, okay, away from home may be easier, but I'm sure it's not easy. It wouldn't have been easy here in India because everybody would want to talk cricket with you, I'm quite sure. Yeah, and that's okay. And, and I think um, one of the great things that we need to keep conscious of is, is really embracing the cricket, the culture, uh, the love for the game. You know, we're very lucky to have, like you and I, we're part of this great sport that allows us to connect with people in different parts of the world, that pays a few bills, that allows us to put food on the table. And we have a duty and a role to make the game better than when we found it and make it more accessible and enjoyable for future generations. And I think that's what we've got to keep focusing on here because if we keep taking things away from the game and we don't put something back in, it's like a bank account. Ultimately, you run out of funds and it's not sustainable. So I think embracing the culture, and I do love coming to places like India where the passion for cricket is so great because it opens doors, it starts conversations, it generates relationships. And you know, I'm just a cricket umpire from Sydney who struggles to walk down the street in Mumbai to go from the hotel to the to the supermarket or the bazaar to get a few things without being stopped and and asked for autographs and how wonderful that is and 
how lucky are we to be involved in the game that allows us to see parts of the world we wouldn't necessarily see, but more particularly to make lifelong relationships and friendships right through to today. Exactly. And, you know, umpiring, they say, is a thankless job. How much do you agree with that because of the amount of pressure you may face when, say, you get some things wrong, but your excellence as such is perhaps acknowledged maybe once in a year when the awards are given out. So is that, in a sense, something you agree with? Because, you know, it's, it's quite said so often, you know. I can understand the perception. And I can understand the question. I don't necessarily agree with it a lot. But yeah. from the outside, it might look like that. But yeah, look, you know, umpiring is a hygiene factor. When you do well, no one says anything. When you do poorly, of course, all they do is criticise you and tell you how bad you've been. So when you, when you start umpiring, it's a, it's a fascinating sort of um, expectation that people think that you should be perfect when you start and then somehow get better. And as you continue through your career, you become even more perfect. There isn't such a thing. I think from an umpire's perspective, we do it, as I said before, because we love it. But if you're doing it to be thanked, if you're doing it to be acknowledged, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You should be doing it because it's challenging. It really does teach you a lot about yourself. It tests every part of who you are and it tests your eyesight, your hearing, your conflict resolution skills, your people management skills. A lot of joy from the camaraderie of our umpiring team and our scoring team. I've talked just briefly about some of the relationships that we've built with various people in hotels, um, you know, various cities that we go to. Uh, I've got family friends in Calcutta, Mumbai in particular, uh, Delhi, People who, and, and the umpires that I've worked with in the training and the performance area, you know, they're people that we connect with almost every week. And if you expect that people are going to thank you every time you walk off the field and you're doing it for them, I think you're a bit misguided. You're doing it for yourself and you're doing it for your team. Um, and you, you mentioned some of those awards. Uh, look, they're nice because they, the, they raise the profile of umpiring and and show that there's a career path and umpiring is an important part of the game. But for me, those awards are, you know, they're, they're awkward because we are a team and for one person to get an award is awkward. But on the flip side, I'm really pleased for my coaches, my, my trainers, my colleagues, my family, the people who allow me to sacrifice so much and they sacrifice a lot to be able to see that it's been worthwhile and it's been recognised. But um, if you're umpiring for appreciation and thank you, I'm not sure you're in the right business. Yeah, all those learnings that you've gotten over the years being on the international circuit resulted in you writing this. And I've had the pleasure of reading it as well. And I must say, you know, you've documented everything very well. How easy or challenging was it, you know, getting it all together in this one book? And it's quite, it's quite summarized. I'm sure, you know, you would have had a lot more to share as well. Well, I've tried to, look, I've tried, in that book, uh, Nishad, I've tried to share my transferable skills, what helped get me to the top and keep me there for a while and why, why the process is so important that you touched on before. And although it's got umpiring examples in there and it's got cricket examples to demonstrate uh, the, the really key messages and learnings, there's something in that book for everyone. And hopefully you got something out of that that you might be able to apply to the way you go about what you do to improve who and what you are. Um, but I love going places where no one's been before. I love challenging myself around doing new things. Um, if we do the same things every day, we're gonna get the same results we've always got. And for me, this challenge of writing a book to sort of help underpin my coaching and performance development work that I have with companies and corporates and sporting organisations and also individuals. It's almost like a business card in that way and it gives people a real taste of maybe how I can help them and they're able to make that decision. But um, I made a lot of mistakes in writing that book. You know, um, it, it 
there's something that you don't get right the first time. I got some pretty good people here locally who have written uh, 14, 15 self-published books. And I had a number of meetings with those people. I still see them today. They gave me the benefit of their experience. I then used four or five people who I would send chapters off to and said, would you mind having a read of this and tell me what you, what you think? Where have I made a mistake? What do you like? And it's that constant refinement process like everything else. You know, you learn by making mistakes and all of a sudden then you come up with something and then you give it to a publisher and then they change more stuff. So <laughs> it took me about, I'll give you an idea. It took me about seven or eight weeks to write it. Mm. It took me about six months to publish it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <I've> been <laughs> you know, so um, getting all the thoughts out on paper was the easy part. It was the refinement, uh, the grammar checks, the spelling checks, the linkages, um, the writing style, and then sort of, you know, polishing it, trying to get it into a, a format where people would enjoy to read it, and doing those summary chapters. You know, that's just and writing it the way that I would like to read a book. And yeah, it's it's. It's different. But what, what was really fascinating about the book was the fact that you were very honest about a lot of things, like especially the, the difficult test match you had in Trent Bridge, then uh, also about the Lahore uh, episode. Was it, mm. was it very difficult putting that on paper as compared to, say, the other happier moments or the other easier lessons that you know you could have you put out for the book? Yeah, it's a good question, Nishad, because... For me, whether it's about talking about a negative event or whether it's about you know, doing a self-assessment, um, I think a couple of things are really key here that I'd love people to, to listen very carefully to. Brutal honesty, if you want to get better, if you want to improve what you do, brutal honesty is an absolute must. When, when I see people playing the blame game or playing victim, they're, they're looking externally and they're not actually taking responsibility themselves for what's not working. I also find talking about Lahore and that terrible event is almost like my way of dealing with it. And the more I talk about it, the more comfortable I can live with myself around what happened on that day. So I don't keep it inside. And one of the biggest things I learned in my career, if I did my career all over again as an official, I'd talk more about my mistakes. I'd get them out in the open. I'd sort of name it and claim it and then be able to deal with it better and faster. That's something I do differently. But I think what's really important around the self-assessment thing as well is that honesty component. And I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be perfect. Some of the best feedback I get is from my wife and kids who tell me how many faults and how many failings I've got on a daily basis. <laughs> I'm not, you know, and and with that, that, that constructive feedback sometimes, if not, it's just, you know, they, they tell it the way it is. And I think what's really important is, is we accept all feedback that we get. And then there's a bit of a skill in deciding what to keep and what to throw away. Um, but brutal honesty, humility, you know, that trait that we don't know at all. And the game, as I said before, keeps throwing up new challenges at us. And one of the challenges in this environment right now is we're all in this together. Mm. Everyone's being affected by COVID-19. Yet there's no one person, one industry, one team that is actually not directly or indirectly affected. This is a global problem. And we will either be successful or otherwise together. And we need to learn and help from each other. And, and to do that, means that we have to have this tremendous humility around less ego and more inclusivity around people who might know something that we don't. What can we learn from the person who's sitting next to us? It's really important. Simon, as always, a great, great learning experience talking to you, not just, obviously I've been, I've read this book, I've learned a lot, but this is the second or third time that I've gotten this chance to speak to you at length. And there's so much to learn. But before we end this, a uh, little bit about your backdrop, because, you know, that is a site that we all are missing at the moment. You know, I'm missing yeah. backgrounds a lot. Tell us about the backdrop. I'll stand aside. I took this photo last week. 
This is um, about five minutes away from my home in southern New South Wales in a town called Barrow. This is where the great Don Bradman grew up from the age of two. His parents moved here and, and this is Glebe Park where they created Bradman Oval and you can see the pavilion in the background. And just behind that is the Bradman International Hall of Fame. And there's a museum within there as well, but it's a very modern museum. Don't, when you say museum, people think there's just old, old artifacts and memorabilia, and there is some of that. But the Hall of Fame is actually a celebration of cricket. And it's quite fascinating to see how many Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Sri Lankans actually do visit on a daily basis. And I'm lucky enough that I reckon it was about three or four years ago that I actually umpired a first grade game there with my second son, Jack. And to officiate, you know, together with my son on that oval, Bradman Oval, uh, was a tremendous thrill. But you can see that this is a winter's day. Uh, our temperatures are about 10 degrees at the moment. Mm. There's no breeze, a blue sky. You can see how beautiful it is. And we're very lucky to live in a country like this and to have fresh air, clean water, and also be in the background of uh, Don Bradman and Bill O'Reilly. Exactly. And uh, as you said, a lot of uh, people from the subcontinent go there because it's a pilgrimage spot for all the cricket fans here anyways. We had Sachin here about four years ago now when he was uh, inducted as a Bradman honoree. And we, we got in a helicopter from Sydney and flew down here. It's about a 15 minute ride in a helicopter. And uh, so Sachin's been here and he's toured around and really enjoyed the place. and. You know, if it's good enough for Sachin to come, maybe it's good enough for some people. Once restrictions have been released and relaxed, we'd love to see more people come through what is really a cricket mecca here in Australia. Exactly. And we are waiting for that day when restrictions are eased, we are back to doing, things are good again. And yes, we would be able to meet again, watch the sport we love. Simon, this has been really great. Thank you so much for doing this. And I wish you and your family good health, safety, and yes, as we always do, when I meet you, namaste, because we aren't allowed to shake hands now. <laughs> exactly. That was Simon Toffel, ladies and gentlemen. He's a lot more Indian than you think.